run. Wow, what a crowd. So many people here in beautiful Krakow. Um, very, very, very welcome. Uh, I'm really speechless uh, that there are so many people here interested in a, let's be honest, a totally boring problem. Let's, let's be honest. We've solved caching. Every, pro every project really did it. And let's be honest, it's easy. It's just map, get, put, and you're done. No, unfortunately not. Um, welcome to my talk on uh, a topping called caching for business applications. And why do I say business applications? Because I think uh, that, let's be honest, most of us do not work for uh, some crazy social media, whatever sites that have very specific scalability problems. I would take a guess that most of us here work for, let's say, rather boring business applications, uh, including me, um, where I think caching is sometimes a little bit of a sensitive problem that leads to a lot of insecurity in many projects. And throughout the years, I encountered the topic on various locations and whatnot. And I thought, hey, why not summarize your insights and your experiences, your personal failures and whatever, into a talk called Caching for Business Applications. Um, my name is Michael Plöth. I come from Germany, uh, Bavaria, uh, and I work for a consulting company called InnoQ. And most of the time I'm traveling around uh, being a conference tourist or a consultant in various projects uh, in various enterprises. Um, if you want, you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is at BitBoss. Right after the talk, I will publish the slides, a link to the slides on Twitter, so you can download them or check them out afterwards and so on, or you can get in contact with me through Twitter. Now, um, there is a couple of things. The, Topic of caching is a very big and a very broad topic, and squeezing this into um, 50 minutes is a little bit hard. So I decided that I will mostly talk about best practices, some ideas how you can establish caching uh, for your um, applications, some caching types and some topologies, but I will not get into extremely low-level uh, concurrency, latency, networking, uh, whatever topics of caching, and I will also not discuss how, you, how to configure, let's say, a, a second-level cache for Hibernate or JPA or something like that. Um, if we first look at the definition of a cache, we read that a cache in computing is a component that transparently stores data so that future requests for that data can be served faster. And there is a couple of other definitions like a cache hit, a cache miss, uh, and so on and so forth. So a basic idea would be, hey, that's awesome. Let's cache everything. Let's distribute these things like crazy in our uh, network environment. Let's put it in a cluster. Let's add a transaction management to that. And by the way, Twitter and Facebook are, have been doing that for ages. Um, I would say uh, such a statement would be a career limiting move uh, when you say that to your boss or when the boss allows you to do that and the whole thing goes into production. Um, so that's probably not the best idea. And especially the last part is something that I have witnessed extremely often in architecture discussions at various customers I've been working with. This, hey, let's choose that technology because Twitter and Facebook are using them. And um, as much as I respect the work of the Twitters, Facebooks, Googles, Amazons, and so on in the world, we need to be very clear that the applications that we are usually working with uh, do have totally different non-functional requirements than, for instance, some social media sites do have. So there's a, a, a huge difference. Let's take a look at an insurance company, for instance, or at a bank, an online bank. Let's take an online banking example. Uh, if I go to an online banking team and I tell them, hey, draw me your scalability graph, the amount of users, the amount of requests you expect in the next week on a piece of paper. They, they are like, yeah, I 
probably looks like that. In the evenings, it gets a, bit, a little bit more, uh, and so on and so forth. So basically, this is, in terms of scalability, extremely predictive. Of course, there is some variations around, let's say, 10 to 20 percent, but that's it. Um, if I ask that question to some folks at Twitter, they would probably say, who? <laughs> it depends on what happens in the world. Now imagine Donald Trump turning into Homer Simpson in the White House. He's suddenly Homer Simpson. Twitter would go nuts. Basically, it would explode within milliseconds. So there is a huge difference in terms of non-functional requirements that you have for a business application and that you have in, I would say, those, those very modern internet company uh, kinds of applications. Of course, those folks are driving the future and these technologies are squeezing into the enterprises, but we need to be aware of the non-functional requirements that we have. Um, and I, what I have witnessed is that some teams either um, approached the topic too aggressively so that they cached way too much stuff, that they made very big heap sizes for caching, went uh, for uh, distribution and so on and so forth, and they ran into problems. And then I have seen some teams that say, oh, let's limit our cache sizes, let's be extremely conservative with caching here. Um, Let's, let's do small caches, let's not cache everything. But they ran into problems as well. Um, I would say um, uh, extreme limit on uh, cache sizes can be a absolute performance killer for your application. And the application, and I will dwell into that um, later on, uh, you could basically kill your application with an improper caching strategy. Now, um, if I look at that, but I, I think if you do a, I would say, if you consider a couple of factors, a couple of best practices, a couple of gotchas, I think you can make applications that are scalable, faster, and especially also cheaper to operate. Now, when I go to some, some of you, let's say you, and I say, hey, introduce caching. I'm your boss, you introduce caching. And you go to Google and uh, search for well, hmm, okay, caching. And you will find a plethora of things in terms of caching, uh, like database cache, heap cache, processor cache, disk cache, local cache, distributed cache, uh, invalidating cache, uh, uh, HTTP cache, and so on and so forth. Now, I can't discuss all of these things in my remaining 40 minutes. Um, I will focus in this talk on local, and distributed caching on an application level. Because most of us, uh, Geekon is a uh, Java conference, so we are mostly at home at the application level, where we are writing our Spring Boot code, our Java EE code, our Java code, maybe some Groovy code. This is the stuff we, as developers, can easily influence. That's where we have a grip on things. Not, I would say, on the, uh, let's say, load balancer. It would involve a lot of communication with the ops department and, uh, and stuff like that. So that's going to be uh, my focus of this talk. And when we want to introduce caching, so I told you, you, you introduced my caching stuff. I assume you have a couple of questions uh, regarding that topic. Um, the first que question might be, what's the impact on the infrastructure for caching? Um, which kind of cache, which product, which tool, which framework should I actually use? How about data consistency? That's a very big topic. Uh, how about uh, the location where I should cache? Should I cache on my data access level? Should I rather cache on my business logic level? Should I cache on the level of my HTTP REST controller, for instance? Um, or which kind of data should I cache? Should I cache everything? Should I be, be very reckless or should I rather be conservative in terms of caching? The next thing is how do I introduce caching? Do I go big bang, um, fully distributed in the first step without optimizing my application? Um, or do I optimize my application and then go ahead in smaller steps? And finally, I do not want to swamp my code with a lot of, uh, let's say, caching. IPI stuff. 
So how is there any kind of um, abstraction in place? Now, the first thing I would like to address is where in my application should I cache? And I will lead you now through, I think it's 12 or 13 gotchas, best practices, food for thought items uh, in terms of caching. The first thing is you should identify a layer in your application that is especially suitable for your caching. Let's take a look at a boring standard N-tier architecture here. So we have some uh, kind of a REST controller, then we have some business logic, we have a uh, data integration layer in our application, and that integration layer is talking to, let's say, uh, COBOL applications on host applications, like the real old school IBM kind of stuff. Um, we have SAP, an SAP integration where we are talking to some RPs from SAP applications, and we have some Spring data repositories where we're uh, basically interacting with our own database, for instance. Now, when I look at this uh, picture here, I, I see a, a various options for introducing caching. For instance, we could use HTTP caching on the REST controller. We could cache the results of read operations on our business service. We could think about caching the read operations of the data aggregation manager. The same applies to the host commands, the SAP commands, and in terms of the Spring Data Repository, we could even think about caching the results of read and write operations. Why do I add the right thing here? If you work with JPA or Hibernate, you obviously have some sort of an ID generation. And sometimes, depending on the generation strategy, you get the ID after inserting it to the database. So obviously, for caching, you need some sort of an ID. So I need to be able to cache the right operation here. And this is our home turf here, I'd like to say. This is where our data is. We know what's happening with our data in our database. We don't know what's happening with a write operation on an S in an SAP system, how the data gets transformed. But I assume that in our database, we have that kind of knowledge. So those are basically um, the layers that I would say are suitable. And I will leave out the HTTP part for the rest of the discussion. I would like to focus on, on these kinds of layers, and I'm also not going to talk about uh, JPA, Spring Data, whatever specifics here. Now, the second advice I'd like to give you is to stay local with your caching as long as possible. If you have an application that ha is structured in a way that you can work only with a local cache which resides in your heap memory. You are a very lucky person and you should be very thankful for being in this position because hell awaits after you leave local in terms of caching. Now, what do I mean with local? Now, we have our boring N-tier architecture over there and we have the cache sitting next to the application inside our JVM. I would say that is the typical Google Guava EH cache uh, kind of scenario that you usually uh, are working with here. Now, this is a scenario that is extremely performant because we do not work with, uh, we do not have to deal a lot with latency, with availabilities of the cache. Uh, because the only latency that we have is Java in memory access, which is blazing fast and which is very nice. And basically the thing is, uh, if, our if the cache goes down, our application is probably down as well. If the application goes down, the cache goes down as well. Now, if you are able to work in such an environment, as I said, you are a very lucky person. But let's take a look at a more realistic environment. Um, usually applications are distributed. So we, we want to have a fallback server. We want to um, work with load balancing. So usually that doesn't work for a web application. Okay, one Tomcat, nice. If the Tomcat goes down, we're unavailable, we're losing money, our boss gets mad at us, we get fired. Um, so obviously we go ahead and split that up into various JVMs. 
So we have now four Tomcat instances running, or four Spring Boot applications with Java minus jar, whatever jar file there is running. Now, if we are working with a plain local cache, we might get into trouble. But it depends on your functional and non-functional requirements. Now, let's say I add some data in, one in, in this one. I'm not that big that I can reach up there. I add some data in there. My, myself as a person, Michael Plöd, living in Nuremberg, Bavaria, Germany. Now, um, I load the same person again, but I end up in this node. So I get added in there as well. Um, so both of them hold a person with an ID, let's say one, two, three, which is me, Michael Plöd. Now, I change my address. I move from Nuremberg to Krakow, because I like Krakow a lot. Um, now, I do that um, on this node here. Now, this node knows that I am living in Krakow, not in Nuremberg. But the node over there, basically, still has me in its belly with me living in Nuremberg. So we have a data inconsistency here. And this is a scenario that you can mitigate with, uh, for instance, time to live, time to idle configurations on your cache. But you need to check out um, how, how sensitive your data is. For instance, a country list, like the list of all countries of the world, is something where I can say I can cache in a manner like this with, let's say, a timeout of an hour, which is like an eternity on a busy application server. Because the scenario that a country gets added to the list, that a country gets renamed, or uh, that a country gets removed from the list, is a rather rare scenario. And the stakes that we are doing business here should be something we, we're, we should be looking at. Um, so that is a scenario that would work. So in this scenario, you can still achieve a sufficient level of consistency that is okay for your business by working with timeouts. But you have certain scenarios where this is absolutely unacceptable, uh, such a scenario. So what uh, the next thing we should uh, be discussing um, is um, what about the consistency of the data? Now. The next uh, aspect we can add is we can connect those caching nodes together. We can uh, let them communicate together. And this is something where we talk about a clustered caching. For instance, EH cache has a configuration where I can configure the nodes that they are communicating with each other over, let's say, TCP or UDP, usually through a multicast protocol or something like that. So they can notify each other of changes, of additions, of evictions, of timeouts, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, there are two, I would say, in this scenario, two major strategies that you can work with. And you need to take a close look at the caching solution that you choose, which of those strategies are supporting by, supported by them. For instance, InfiniSpan has a slightly different feature set than EH cache, for instance. Uh, a Terracotta cache has a different feature set than InfiniSpan. Hazelcast looks totally different than those kinds of things. Now, you need to be aware. I'm going to introduce now two major strategies that you can work with. The first one is invalidation, and the second one is replication. And in terms of invalidation, there are actually uh, two sub-strategies for invalidation. Now, I would always, always prefer invalidation over real replication. I would like to avoid real replication, like every major problem that I have faced in, con uh, in uh, production systems with caching, I would say nearly everyone, like 80, 90 percent, would was a scenario where real replication was involved. Now, why do I think like that? Let's take a look at the invalidation. For invalidation on the first strategy, 
we go ahead and load some data into our node. So we put some stuff, a customer with the ID number one, let's say that's me, um, into every node. So every node has the customer with the number one initially put into the cache. Fair enough. Everything's running smooth, but suddenly on one node, I go ahead and update the person. So I'm moving from Nuremberg to Krakow. Now this node sends an invalidation message to the other nodes and they remove their um, outdated data. So basically the, the only cache that has the updated data is the one down there. A different invalidation strategy looks like that. We add the person to one node and the cache only allows to, to for one specific entity to live in one certain node. So as soon as I add the person to another node, it gets removed. So that is, for instance, the default invalidation behavior of InfiniSpan. It looks like this. Um, now, that's the one thing. The bad, bad beast, however, is the replication. Replication looks like this. We add the person to the cache and it gets replicated. So the real physical data gets replicated. It gets spread out through all other nodes of our application here. Now, why do I think that this is a little bit troublesome? The reason is um, you have a lot, a lot of network traffic going on when I replicate all the data all the time throughout my network. So this is something that you really see in your network monitoring, that you really feel in your network monitoring. And um, that can be a little bit troublesome here and there. Now, um, another scenario that we would be running into with especially invalidation strategy one, where we could potentially keep the customer on every node, and the replication is that all nodes would, could potentially contain all customers in their heap memory. So far in our story about caching, all the data would reside in the heap memory of the application. Now, heap isn't something that is infinite. Now, uh, I would say a good heap size for a Java application is something like four or eight gigabytes of RAM. Who's running their production system with four gigabytes of RAM? Eight? Sixteen? Twenty-three? Are you running production systems? <laughs> Two? Ah, okay couple of here. So I would say the ma majority of people was like in clocking in at two, four or eight gigabytes of RAM. So is Beekeep a solution? So I have many customers, but I do not get around, let's say, eight gigabytes or four gigabytes of heap space here. Now, um, I could increase my heap size, let's say, to 32 gigs. Um, I could, but this is something that I should consider in terms of the inf uh, impact on my infrastructure. Because big heaps is something that I would avoid just for caching. Uh, because um, you need to think about the garbage collection process in the JVM if you do that. Um, because you have two very conflictive kinds of, of data in your heap memory. The one is for the caching, which is very long-lived. So this is data that's usually moving th uh, through the survivor spaces into uh, like the old generation in our heap. The other one is our business data, the business objects that we are working with for computations, for processes, and stuff like that. And these are usually objects that live by the uh, motto of the good die young. So the good objects get garbage collected uh, very fast and tuning the garbage collection is very hard in those places because you have a couple of things where you would like to tune like the old collection or stuff like that, where you, you would tune for, let's say, old 
generation, survivor spaces and so on, and the other one towards the young collection and so on. So you, you have a conflict here. And there is another downside um, involved in this. Um, a big heap can lead to long to very long garbage collections. Yes, even with Java 8, you can run into issues here. Uh, and what, what can an issue be? Let's say you work in an environment where you have something, let's say, something extremely enterprisey, a web sphere application server with a node manager and, and all, these, all these horrible things. Um, what can happen here? Now, if, we, if I have these things running in a cluster, and there is a cluster management instance, and suddenly a very long end of the world GC is running, these applications wouldn't be responding. So there is a chance that they get kicked out of the cluster by your node manager of the, of the, uh, of the cluster of the application service. And the same can happen to this one. And that's something that your ops people obviously do not want. Now, a very easy solution would that be, okay, let's, let's not do that. Let's limit our cache size. Now, we limit the size of our cache buckets so that we can live with four gigabytes, but the caches are rather small. This is a horrible idea. Do not do that. You will kill your application with this. Um, and I've actually seen an online banking system in Germany stalling in production because of a small distributed cache. Now, this is the, the worst case scenario that you can run into. You, you limit your cache size, so you have some eviction policy, let's say least recently used or something like that, and uh, it's like a glass of water. Now, this is my, my glass of water. And this is my water bottle. And you can see when I pour water in there, sorry, um, it will get full. Now, what, what has to happen? Water has to leave the glass so that new water can come into. And this is what's happening when you work with small caches. Now, I, add, I want to add some data, so I have to squeeze some data out of the cache. And when this is happening all the time, and now imagine a scenario where you have a replicating cache. What's happening? This cache is going to kill your network. Because eviction, replication of the eviction. Adding, replication of the adding. Eviction, adding. Communication, 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 data, 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 network, boom, it's dead. It's going to kill you. And this is exactly what I have seen happening in production. And the solution to get the application up and running again in a very performant manner was to disable and remove the cache. The application, and I've seen that on another application that was running very slow because of the cache, by removing the cache, the application got more stable and was faster. Now, this is not a very good idea to do, especially when you work with replication. Now, how do we deal with this problem? Now, we have a lot of data. We want to cache it. It's suitable. It's good. A solution for that is a different strategy called distribution. A distributed cache goes ahead and moves the cache out of your JVM, usually to some, uh, I would say, some instances. Typical contenders in this market are something like Couchbase, Hazelcast, um, and so on and so forth. The whole category of data grids and so on all clock into this category. Now, we move the cache out of this and we can scale the nodes of the cache. Yes, we add network latency to our portfolio of problems here. But on the other hand, we can grow the data and still be safe. Let's take a, a closer look how this distribution strategy, the distributed strategy actually works. We are starting off with one node. Let's say we start up one Hazelcast node for our cache. We add a couple of customer data here. 23, 30, 27, 32. Now, we, we realize, hmm, we want to be more fail safe against the cache, and we, need, we basically need, eventually need a little bit more data in, in, in the 
upcoming future. Let's add a second node. Now what's happening, usually transparently when I do that with these kinds of uh, caches, is that um, we distribute the data and we back up the data on both nodes. Now I add a third node. I see a further distribution and a backing up. I add a fourth node. I see a further distribution and a backup. This is how the distribution strategy works. And you see, if I kill node 4, customer 32 gets removed, it's away. The backup of 30 is away. But that's no big deal, because we have the customer 30 on node 3, and the 32 is backed up on node 2. So we don't have any data loss here. And you can usually configure this. And so this leads us to a scenario where we can A, tune our application better, and um, we can use smaller heaps by gaining more capacity. Now, in this, especially in that kind of scenario, you have a very new best and a very best friend. That's your ops folks, your operations specialists. Because these distributed caches are something that, that shouldn't be uh, let's say, configured and introduced by the Java specialist or by the Hibernate specialist. Hey, add a distributed Hibernate cache. Do that for me with JBoss cache. Bad idea. You need a lot of network know-how and you need a lot of know-how on your networking topology here as well. Just a warning, involve the ops folks very early in that process when you want to introduce something like that. Now, the next question, which data should I cache? You should take a look at selecting suitable data for caching. The perfect data for caching is read mostly data. So that is data that you read a lot and do not write so much, especially when it's data that is very expensive to obtain and to load. For instance, grabbing data out of an SAP system. SAP is a great stuff, absolutely, but it's not the quickest stuff in the world, to be honest. So it might be a good idea to cache the data a little bit on our side. Um, if you really have to cache write intensive data and you work in a distributed caching environment, um, this is your major use case for a distributed cache as well because you drive down the amount of replication in the cluster. So that will work out as well. Now, another question is um, which cache should I use? Rule number eight is like the first rule of Fight Club. I don't know if you've seen the movie Fight Club. The first rule of Fight Club is do not talk about Fight Club. The first rule of caching is never write your own caching implementation ever. <laughs> do not do that. Yes, it's very interesting. It's a lot of fun. We are all nerds and geeks and whatever, and we like to play around with latency and so on. But it is a very bad idea to do that for your job because other people probably have solved these problems for a very long time with very much experience and probably better than I could personally ever write a cache implementation. Don't do that. Absolutely not, unless you want to get fired. Um, there are many, many, many good and existing cache implementations. It's like a zoo, so you can choose which stuff you want to see. I want to go to the, to the tigers, I want to go to the pet zoo, I want to go to the whatever, birds or so on. Same thing for caching. There is an existing implementation for every need and every taste and every requirement out there unless you're really doing bleeding, bleeding, bleeding edge kind of stuff. Then eventually you might run into that thing, but I would assume that 99% of the people in this house are absolutely well with using one of those options. Now, another question that can arise is, how do I introduce the caching? I would introduce caching in three steps. First step is optimize your application. Caching is no bug fix for, I, I, I choose drastic word, developer incompetence. It's not a solution for fixing your N plus one selects problems or your Cartesian product problems and whatever. And then I would go for a local cache, which leaves us 
gives us a huge performance boost. But please do some uh, expectation management here, because going to the distributed cache will lead to a certain performance loss because we add latency. For instance, in terms of Hazelcast, ah, you, you lose a double of the performance of the cache access. So a cache access that takes, let's say, 100 milliseconds in a local manner can easily move to 200 to 250 milliseconds when you work distributed over the network. Please manage expectations. Don't tell your stakeholders, we'll get even faster when we add a distributed cache. No, you're solving different problems. Data growth, scalability, security, and stuff like that. Now, another thing here is optimized serialization. Um, especially professional cache implementations come with your own serializers. Let's give me I have an example on Hazelcast here. Now, we have uh, 10,000 objects, get, put, time, payload size. And serializable is the typical Java serialization. Data serializable and identifier data serializable are Hazelcast serializers. Now, take a look at those numbers. These are easily reproducible. I have a, a example project on my GitHub, so if you're interested, you can verify those numbers very easily on your own machine. Now, as you see, Java serialization clocks in at 1287 milliseconds. Identifier data serializable is approximately a sixth of the time by using less data. Very impressive stuff. If you have alternatives available, do not use Java serialization. Use optimized serializers here you gain a lot of uh, performance by using them. The 11th point is you can consider using off-heap storage as well for caching. So off-heap caches are usually strategies that you find in professional enterprise-grade caching solutions. There is an initiative under an Apache li license called Apache Direct Memory. Um, but I would say it's, it's in a growing kind of state. Would I recommend it as a consultant to a chief architect at a bank or an insurance company? Probably not. Uh, but if you are willing to pay license fees to, for a product in terms of caching that delivers off-heap storage, this can be something that should, that should be very interesting for you. Uh, because off-heap storage goes ahead and moves the cache data out of your JVM actually into a nat native process. So a native Windows, Linux, whatever process that you have, and you avoid the garbage collection up there. But you obviously have some local communication between the two, and you can tune uh, the garbage collection very, very well um, in this scenario as well. Is off-heap storage something I would heavily recommend for every project to adopt? No. If you have special problems in terms of data growth that you really need a lot, a lot, a lot of data, then off-heap storage is something that can be interesting for you. But don't do it be just because of it's cool. Just because you have the requirement. One thing that I see also see very, very often being ignored by many teams is the security thing. We have sophisticated access control on our database. Our SAP systems are highly secured. Access to message brokers is secured. We have HTTPS and so on. And now we're sucking in all of the data into our cache. Boom. And there it lies unencrypted, without access control, in our JVM. Everybody that can do a heap dump on that machine can steal the data that is highly secured in the CRM system, in the host system, in the database, and so on. So please be aware that this can be an issue if your audit takes a close look at your application. Um, I've seen that at one customer in, I think it was Hamburg or yeah, it was Hamburg, I think. Where the audit team said, one week before go live, this solution cannot go into production because of security implica implica implications on the cache. You need to use a cache 
that secures the access to the data. Now, please be aware of that, especially when you work with distributed caches. There are a couple of professional solutions out there that implement JAS security and uh, that have security mechanisms. Just be aware of that um, if you're working with very sensitive information in your cache, because it's something that easily gets ignored. So obviously, we want to add something up there. <coughs> now. The thirteenth uh, point that I have is please abstract your cache provider in your code. Let's take a look at this code. This is a code uh, where we retrieve some account stuff based on an account number. Mm. And you see there is a lot of code, but can you easily spot what the real business logic in there is? No. Caching is a cross-cutting concern. And on all of those lines of code, we are having heavy ties um, to, uh, the, um, for instance, uh, EH Cache API. If I want to switch from EH Cache to Hazelcast, I would have to address every single of these lines of code, which is not the most pleasant task in the team, obviously. Now, you can't switch cache providers between the things because EH cache is highly coupled to, to your code. Uh, and you obviously mess up your business logic with cross-cutting concerns with infrastructure like caching. The, in the Java world, there are right now, I would say, two major solutions for that. The first one is the JCache standard, which is a Java EE standard that's not yet officially in Java EE because they didn't make uh, a timeline uh, for um, Java EE 7, uh, but it's already specified. A lot of um, uh, tools and providers already support JCache, but there is, and I'm going to use that as an example, also the Spring Cache abs uh, abstraction. So if you work with a Spring application, Spring delivers you a very good and a very sophisticated abstraction for your cache provider. Let me take, let's take a look at uh, some configuration. I chose some old school Spring XML configuration because, uh, especially for the caching, it's more readable and more understandable than the programmatic um, uh, definition. And everybody in conference talks these days is using uh, the Spring programmatic uh, configuration. So I said, I, I want to use XML. So what we're doing here, we're defining a EH cache manager up there and um, a factory bean that's uh, also taking into account a configuration for EH cache. The spring cache abstraction does not configure your cache. You do not configure time to live, network nodes, security, stuff like that. It's just, hey, spring talk to this cache provider X w in your abstracted way. And then you can use annotations like add cacheable, add cache put, add cache evict, and so on in your application code. I mean, we could go on for an, uh, another hour and talk about the Spring Cache abstraction. Just some food for thought, a small hint to you folks. If you want to do that, there is a solution in the Java E space called JCache, and there is a solution for that in the Spring space called the Spring Cache abstraction. And of course, the Spring Cache abstraction is also fully compatible with JCache, so you can easily use both of them uh, together in your applications. Now. I've showed you 13 hints, best practices, gotchas, around caching for your applications. Is that everything about caching? Hell no. We could use another three days throughout the conference and talk about that topic. That's just some food for thought. Is that everything that I've showed you? The perfect solution, the silver bullet for all problems? No. But I hope that I managed to give you some couple of insights and consideration points when you come across the topic, what you can think of, what you can consider, which options you have, um, where you can uh, look forward uh, or further reading and stuff like that. So to close this up, I want to thank you very, very much for uh, the amount of people that showed up in there. I, I, I'm absolutely blown away. Thank you very much. I will post the slides as soon as I'm at Krakow Airport. 
today. Unfortunately, I can't stay for the rest of the conference because I have to go to the Spring I.O. conference to Barcelona today. Um, but if there is a couple of questions left, um, feel free to raise them to come up to me. And um, you can follow me on Twitter, at Bitboss, for slides and further contact and so on. Thank you very much. <laughs>